In the modern age, the internet has allowed us to experience and interact with a myriad of personalities beyond our circles of family and friends. Celebrities, creators, and purveyors of dank memes, artificial intelligences, even wholly fabricated characters created by individuals or collectives, all at the tips of our fingers, ready for us to discover. Today, we are given more opportunities than ever before to form parasocial relationships. The parasocial relationship is one which by definition is skewed in favor of one party. Essentially, one person learns so much about another that they feel as though they have a relationship with another. Like those who follow the daily lives of movie stars, or even those of us who use social media to monitor the thoughts and actions of people we've never met offline. Meanwhile, the party being observed is unaware of the observer's existence, hence the relationship being lopsided. But what if a parasocial relationship were able to transcend these boundaries and become a true social relationship? Since the advent of social media, there have been several films to examine the phenomenon of parasocial interactions. But today's subject actually examined this question of making the parasocial simply social three decades ago. The franchise known as Video Girl Eye was recommended to us by Legend 28. While we're fairly certain that Legend 28 intended for us to cover the anime OVA released in the early 90s, we figured that there was a wealth of material to cover, especially with the property being resurrected just this year. Besides, we're not inherently an anime review show, and there are several reviews out there on YouTube by those much better versed in the world of animation than we are. We hope this isn't too much of a stretch, Legend, but today we'd like to look at the significance of Video Girl Eye as a whole, as well as examining some of the peculiar differences between each iteration. For starters though, let's jump into the OVA. As anime fans will likely know, and as viewers of our Otaku no Video episode will recall, the original video animation, or OVA for short, is something like a step between an episodic anime installment and a full feature film. The OVA for Video Girl I, released between March and August of 1992, is composed of six half-hour episodes, making each episode slightly longer than an anime which would be aired on television, while keeping the series' length relatively short. What's more, underage viewers beware, because this show got some titties. The series follows a high school student named Yota Moteuchi, who, after falling on hard times in the relationship world, has earned himself the nickname Dateless. Moteuchi stumbles upon a phantom video store named Gokuraku, or Paradise Video. Here, the elderly shopkeep offers Yota a video with a picture on the cover of a young woman named Ai Amano, who promises that she will comfort the viewer. Taking the video home, Yoda plays Ai's tape on his recently broken VCR, at which point we see the parasocial intent of her videotape. Now, full disclosure, we more or less thought this was where the show would go. A young man falls in love with an artificial intelligence and has to deal with the social blowback of his growing affection for a woman who isn't real. Sounds pretty interesting, right? Sounds like fertile ground for discussing potential implications concerning otaku culture and social seclusion, right? Well, boy were we wrong. See, this whole bit about acquiring Ai's videotape, this is told in flashback. Where does the show begin, then? Why, with Ai Amano transcending the bounds of her magnetic tape housing and bursting from Yoda's television into his bedroom. Hence us saying that the series moves from the idea of a parasocial relationship to that of a social relationship. From here, you can probably guess the tone of the OVA. It's wacky, it's goofy, it's occasionally serious with its treatment of romance among the main characters. But overall, it's bizarre. Upon entering the human world, I scold Yoda for playing her on a broken VCR, as she sometimes experiences glitches. What's more, Yoda soon learns that she only has three months in the world before her runtime will run out, and she will be recalled to the inside of her VHS. Some supernatural elements are, of course, at play, given this setup, but the most important aspect is actually the aforementioned romance. Yota needs Ai's moral support thanks to his maintaining a crush on a classmate named Moemi. Moemi knows nothing about Yota's affections, herself being in love with another classmate, Takashi. Takashi, in turn, has been best friends with Yota, and both of them understand Yota's love for Moemi and Moemi's love for Takashi which leads to Yota and Takashi each trying to set one another up with Moemi quite frequently. Things get even more convoluted once Ai is introduced into the picture. Yota explains her presence away by saying she is his sister, but in actuality begins to fall for her as much as he does Moemi. This culminates in, whew, quite the ending, but uh, we'll get there. 
For those interested in the anime, Video Girl Eye is available in the West on DVD from Viz Video, as well as on VHS for those looking for that true authentic 90s feel. It might be a bit of a chore to acquire for this reason, but it's certainly worth it, as the anime is probably the best part of the franchise in our personal opinion. Before we discuss some of the themes and potential goals of the story though, let's take a look at the other iterations of Video Girl Eye. The anime OVA served as an adaptation of an earlier manga published between 1989 and 1992, and penned by Masakazu Katsura. Katsura had achieved some level of prominence in the 1980s, with works like Wingman and Zetman, but it wasn't until Video Girl I that he began to transition into writing romantic manga. Katsura stated in an interview that at the time, he was dipping his toes into romance territory at the suggestion of others, and that he was more interested in science fiction. However, this interest seems to have swung in the opposite direction in the 1990s, as the high point of his career in the decade following Video Girl's Eye release, namely DNA Squared and Eyes, dropped the pretense of science fiction and transitioned full on into romantic territory. Thus, Video Girl Eye could be said to be a remarkable transition period even if by abs accident. Even if by accident. And I know this is going to look like we're destroying everything, don't worry about it, we don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. More recently, Katsura has released several collaborations with longtime friend and creator of Dragon Ball Z, Akira Toriyama, showing that he's still willing to work with sci fi. Regardless, Video Girl Eye remains one of Katsura's longest single works, and is quite possibly his opus. The manga ran for a hefty 151 chapters, which were later collected into 15 volumes. This includes two bonus volumes concerning other video girls, but as you probably guessed from the length of 13 volumes concerning I, quite a bit of material was cut for the OVA adaption. The anime adapts fairly faithfully chapters 2 through 19, with pieces changed around in the beginning and end of this run. Once these initial 19 chapters conclude, the manga also takes a massive shift from the ending of the OVA, incorporating new characters, more background on the main four present in both takes on the story, and a lengthier time span. Ai even gets another potential love interest, and Yota has to face the consequences of missing many days of school during what he presumes to be the end of Ai's time before being recalled. Pretty much all bets are off at this point, and the manga goes down rabbit hole after rabbit hole, providing some of the deeper lore for the series. In 1991, smack dab in the middle of this manga run, and well before the anime, there was actually a live-action adaptation of Video Girl I. Though really, the less we say about this version the better. The 1991 film was directed by Ryu Kaneda, a sometimes director of anime adaptations, and written by Masahiro Yoshimoto, who has worked largely in TV drama, and who is apparently signed on as the screenwriter for Shenmue 3. Kaori Sakagami, the actor behind Ai, was a pop star at the time, which makes sense for stunt casting during this era. Anyway, this version, produced by Toho, was only released on VHS way back when, and doesn't seem to have been reissued since. Nor has the film been officially released anywhere in the West, meaning that you'll have to rely on imports and fan subs for this one. Truly though, we don't think this one is worth seeking out, as it faithfully adapts the first two volumes or so of the manga, hitting some of the same beats as the OVA. However, beyond the tonal differences which do not serve the film very well, namely that it's overly wacky even by the anime standards, and its funky soundtrack which makes this version feel like a vaporwave fever dream. Video Girl I 1991 isn't much to write home about. If you're looking for a live action adaptation that is worth your time, however, fear not, as in the year of our Lord 2018, we were delivered the answer.
Between January and April of this year, TV Tokyo aired the new drama Dene Shogo Video Girl I 2018, which surprisingly remains in continuity with the franchise's other iterations. Set in modern day, we follow Sho, Yota's nephew who moves into Yota's house and accidentally stumbles upon Ai's videotape from decades prior. Running her on the same, still broken VCR, Sho brings Ai back into the world and all manner of wacky hijinks ensue. The drama hits most of the same beats as previous iterations, what with Sho being dateless and his two friends helping to form a love triangle. Given that this adaptation is twice as long as the OVA, however, we're also treated to some updated versions of storylines drawn from the manga. For instance, the love situation becomes more complicated when a student one year younger than Sho falls for him, a plot which occurs in the manga when Yota is held back a year due to missing too much school. At another point, Ai goes missing for a prolonged period, and rather than entirely disappearing, she returns a new person. Video Girl Ai 2018 is a novel update to the franchise lampshading some of the more outdated aspects of the original manga by having Sho garner dating advice from the internet rather than magazines as Yota did. It also carries forth the parasocial turned social relationship idea by having Yota and another character whom we won't spoil meet Ai once more after years of aging and maturing since their first encounter. What's more, just like with the earlier film, Ai is played by a pop idol, this time Nanase Nishino of Nogizaka 46 so fans of the idol scene might recognize her. Unfortunately, we found out too late that to celebrate the show's wrapping up, there was also a pop-up shop event in Tokyo in late March and early April, selling exclusive Video Girl Eye merch. But fear not, viewers. The Blu-ray box set of the series was released in October of 2018, and fan subs are already available for the drama, so be on the lookout for that release. Over the course of all these iterations, Video Girl Eye examines some pretty interesting topics with respect to how technology has influenced human relationships. Yota's numerous dating magazines and shows later dating advice websites allow both of these young men to consult those who they assume to be older and wiser to compensate for their lack of aptitude with women. In both cases, though admittedly somewhat on accident for show, the young men have become so despondent about their prospects for romance that they have turned to a fictitious woman to fill the void. Ironically, these technologies help them to grow closer to people in the end, but if this were not a science fiction story, and I didn't transport herself into the real world, the tale would likely not be as plucky and whimsical. Temporarily, Yota and Sho seem to feel that their anxieties about dating have been alleviated by Ai's presence, but as it turns out, their situations remain just as complicated, perhaps implying that no matter how technologically advanced we become, there will still be the need for effort and personal relationships. Were Yota's relationship with Ai simply parasocial, this subtext wouldn't exist, but given that she is played on a broken VCR and is thus flawed, just as all humans are, she quickly becomes as complex as any other person. Video Girl Ai thus seems to be telling us that no matter what hardship we may be up against regarding other people, we will still benefit from putting effort in rather than withdrawing. In virtually all iterations of the franchise, this is the lesson that our protagonists learn, save perhaps the film, which has easily the least satisfactory ending of the bunch. Speaking of endings… Alright, fair warning. If you haven't seen the OVA yet, go check it out, as we'll be exploring the final episode here, and thus we'll be spoiling the ending. We good? Good. Then in that case, what the hell is this? When did this become End of Evangelion? Seriously, here we are, puttering along with the love triangle turned love rhombus when all of a sudden Ai's creator steps onto the scene being all like, hey, you're not supposed to be able to love, I'm gonna rewrite your videotape. And we're good up to this point, that's reasonable, right? But then Yota, in an attempt to save her, gets transported into the friggin' television world, where he has to traverse a veritable wasteland of a desert, encountering clay doppelgangers of his friends, only to come across a glass stairway to Ai where he has to face her maker who tries to kill the both of them, only for I to save the both of them at the last minute. Screw 2001 A Space Odyssey, say goodbye to Interstellar, this is the true madman of movie endings. 
I defy you to explain the tonal shift between episodes 5 and 6 of the OVA. I mean, even in the manga, this whole bit comes more or less completely out of left field, and then gets completely shrugged off as Yota just kinda goes back to his daily life for a while afterward. It's such a baffling turn of events that I'm not even really sure what to say about it, but man is it a trip. Part of me wants to believe that this is the main reason Legend 28 wanted us to cover this project in the first place, but I'm just kind of at a loss here. On an abstract level, this portion of the story is telling us how much Yota has grown as a character. He's developed true feelings for Ai and is willing to more or less sacrifice himself to save her. But what's simply captivating here is how this climax is handled. It's like nothing else we've ever seen with regards to what would otherwise be simply a quirky romantic comedy. Video Girl I is a diverse franchise. From the dregs of big studio manga adaptations to the height of anime weirdness, it runs the gamut while remaining fairly consistent in quality and actually managing to maintain some level of continuity. If we had to put it in writing, we would say that the 1991 film is probably the worst of the adaptations, followed by the 2018 drama, which is markedly better and unique given its aims and release date. Then the manga, which is high quality by virtue of its length and the breadth of side stories it covers. And lastly, the OVA sits on top of the pile. The anime provides the most concise version of the story, with probably the best acting of the franchise to boot. Throw in the visual gags that anime allows for when compared to live action, and you've got a recipe for some quality early 90s anime. 